The question of how to deal with death is part of the human condition, for in the end it comes for us all. But with near absolute power, what lengths would you go to try and delay it? In the ancient world, death could come swiftly and out of nowhere. Without antibiotics or the many conveniences of modern medicine, minor injuries and illnesses could easily become fatal. If you were a monarch, your chances were no better, and arguably worse in some regards. With high likelihood of dying in battle or being murdered violently by a rival family member or assassin, peacefully passing away of old age in bed was a luxury afforded by few rulers in antiquity. For some, this would define much of their existence and personality. My name is Derek, and I am the host of the Hellenistic Age podcast, a show dedicated to the period from Alexander the Great to Cleopatra. And today, I wish to bring you the story of one of my favorite figures of the era. In the year 63 BC, on the windswept shores of the Crimean Peninsula, an old man was impatiently pacing back and forth in his room. Holed up in his palace of the city of Pantacopium in the modern Kerch, Mithridates VI, Eupator Dionysius of Pontus, once the most powerful king in the Mediterranean world, was now a prisoner in his own house. Sharing his quarters was his Celtic bodyguard, and the lifeless bodies of his two daughters slumped over in their couches. Outside of the palace, the cheers and celebrations of his soldiers could be heard. Well, they were his soldiers, for they since defected and placed the royal diadem on the head of his rebellious son, Pharnakes II. The prince had long been suspected of plotting against his father and was likely in league with the Roman Republic. Many a Roman commander had eagerly wished to see this long-hated Pontic king dragged in chains through the Eternal City as part of their great triumph. A proud and crafty man, Mithridates and his daughters did not plan to be taken alive, as he always carried a vial of poison in the sheath of his sword to be used lest luck finally run out. This was quite the turn of events for the man who was able to bring his kingdom to its greatest extent in a reign of 50 years, and one must wonder what thoughts were racing through his head as he waited for the cocktail to course its way through his veins. Unexpectedly, he had plenty of time to mull about what led him to this moment. Too much time, really. The man known as Mithridates was born sometime in the late 130s. Heir to the Kingdom of Pontus, which approximately covered northern Turkey, along the Black Sea coast. By that point, the Pontic kings had ruled as relatively minor players in the two centuries following the death of Alexander the Great. Despite the second-rate status of the kingdom, Mithridates' pedigree was impressive. The Mithridatic family traced its ancestry back to the kings of Persia, his name a Hellenized rendition of the Iranian Mithridatha, sent by Mithra, an eastern god of light and order. Yet he would also claim ancestry to the Macedonian kings like Alexander of Seleucus, and was a renowned Philhellene, a lover of all things Greek. Despite being the heir to two imperial traditions, it did him little good in the current political climate. By the mid-2nd century, the dominant successors of Alexander had come to an end. Rome was now the preeminent power in the Mediterranean. Having utterly vanquished its Carthaginian rivals and claimed mastery over the affairs of Greece and beyond, whether out of opportunism or by happenstance, the shadow of the Roman eagle drew further into Asia with each year. The environment in which Mithridates grew up in was anything but stable either. Dynastic politics during the Hellenistic period were vicious, even in the best of times, and Pontus was no exception. His father Mithridates V was assassinated in 120, presumably by poisoning. Upon his father's death, the underage prince and his brother were crowned joint kings, but true power lay in the hands of their mother, Laodike. Rumors swirled of her involvement in the assassination, and allegedly there were already failed attempts on his own life. To protect himself, the boy king fled from his realm to undergo an education away from the plotters and schemers that filled the court. It was customary for Hellenistic rulers to be learned and patrons of the arts and sciences, and in this regard, Mithridates was no different. But by any measure, Mithridates was considered a brilliant man. A renowned polyglot, he could speak no less than 22 different languages. More famous, or infamous, was his reputation as a skilled pharmacologist and toxicologist. 
From an early age, Mithridates was interested in the properties of plants, animals, and minerals, and their effects on the human body. Topping this list were poisonous or toxic substances. No doubt the murder of his father must have deeply affected his psyche, and fear of being assassinated prompted the king to search for ways to prevent a premature demise. According to tradition, Mithridates imbibed trace amounts of poisons and toxic substances daily with an intent to build up immunity, a practice later known as Mithridatism. Mithridates was so brilliant at his craft that he managed to create a universal antidote known as the Mithridatum, guaranteed to protect against all plots and perfidy that may have seen his food or drink spiked. The Roman author Pliny the Elder claims that it was derived from 54 separate ingredients, while the Dr. Celsus lists 34 of various extracts including cinnamon, rose leaves, and frankincense in specific amounts. The mixture would be ground together and served with honey for flavor, or an almond-sized piece to be placed within wine. Is there any science to back up the claims of the Pontic Poisoner's resistance? The idea of the body acclimating to outside factors, whether artificially induced or not, is a common phenomenon. Humans living in higher altitudes develop larger lung capacities and greater oxygen saturation to compensate for the lower air pressure. Muscular structure and bone density increases when we exercise. Vaccines use inactive or modified pathogens to prepare the immune system against infection. But can the same be said for Mithridatism? A similar tale is found in the plays of ancient India, known as the Poison Maidens. Women allegedly fed toxic plants and animal venoms to become deadly enough to kill a man by merely kissing him. Villagers from the region of Styria in modern Austria began making the rounds in medical journals throughout the mid-1800s due to their consumption of arsenic, a highly carcinogenic element found in the crust of the earth that can have severe consequences on the internal organs. Analysis suggests that organisms can gain a resistance over time. A few brave souls of the 21st century like herpetologist Bill Haast and musician Steve Ludwin have repeatedly injected themselves with snake venom, swearing by its medicinal properties or in a pursuit to create anti-venoms. To build up his own immunity, Mithridates would have had access to a number of plants native to the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. Poison hemlock, the same plant used in the execution of Socrates, is a neuromuscular depressant that kills through the collapse of the cardiovascular system. Members of the Solanaceous or Nightshade family can contain tropane alkaloids which block electrical synapses and cause seizures or asphyxiation. Greeks condemned to die in the island of Chios were forced to drink a solution of monkshood or wolfsbane, resulting in paralysis. Animal byproducts were also readily available. There are nearly a dozen species of vipers in Turkey with venom capable of coagulating the blood and necrotizing flesh. Bees that drink from the nectar of the Pontic rhododendron flower produce poisonous honey containing neurotoxins that can cause hallucinations and brachycardia. The historian and general Xenophon reported several of his soldiers suffering from honey madness while campaigning near the Black Sea. Toxic minerals like arsenic were readily available in the nearby mines, which had such potent fumes that hundreds of mine workers died from breathing the air. These could all become tools to aid his investigations into the medical arts, or perhaps weapons to be used to further his own ends. Even as a young man, Mithridates was accused of being a serial poisoner, using his pharmacological knowledge to dispatch his enemies quickly and quietly. Upon his return to Pontus, he assassinated his mother and brother. His sister-wife Laodike was soon poisoned as well. Through diplomacy and subterfuge, Mithridates greatly expanded his influence throughout Anatolia and the surrounding coastline of the Black Sea. He murdered his elder sister and nephew for the throne of Cappadocia, and established an alliance with King Tigranes II of Armenia. The Roman Republic, never keen to see their balance disturbed in the Eastern Mediterranean, took great pains to curb Mithridates' appetite. By the year 89, all chances for a peaceful solution came to an end when the ambitions of both the Roman consul Manius Aquilius and King Mithridates saw the eruption of the First Mithridatic War. The Pontic ruler was a capable commander, capturing Aquilius and pouring molten gold down his throat. But the true bloodbath would take place the following year. 
Mithridates was fully aware that the anti-Roman resentment had been bubbling among the Greeks for decades, and in the spring of 88, he kickstarted an event known as the Asiatic Vespers, a coordinated pogrom of violence that saw upwards of 80,000 Roman men, women, and children across the eastern provinces murdered in a single day. Many Greek city-states switched over to Mithridates' side, looking to the Pontic ruler as a potential liberator from the Italian yoke, the first serious threat to the Roman hegemony in over 60 years. Talented commanders like Sulla were sent to battle Mithridates and his forces, fighting across Greece to restore order. Troubles in Italy sapped the Roman effort though, and a treaty would be struck in late 85, bringing the first war to an end. But neither side truly saw peace as a long-term solution. Young Roman commanders looking to make their bones saw Mithridates as a prime target for revenge, while the king was eager to exploit any chance at Roman weakness that he could. A second and third Mithridatic war soon roared throughout the late 80s and 70s, with Mithridates holding his own. But in the year 66, command would be handed to Pompey Magnus, a highly celebrated and equally ambitious general. Little by little, Mithridates' support dwindled, both abroad and at home. Perhaps his daily dose of toxic substances was doing damage to his mental faculties, causing the king to spiral ever further into paranoia. He murdered one son for capitulating to Pompey, while another was so terrified of his father's wrath that he committed suicide. Mithridates was forced to abandon his capital and retreat to the city of Pantacapayam on the Cimmerian Bosporus. But Pharnakes' coup put an end to any of his future plans. Unfortunately, the so-called Poison King seems to have been too clever for his own good. While the concoction he drank worked as intended for the princesses, the near septuagenarian's condition was about as impacted as if he drank a mild cup of wine. Mithridates tried to speed up the process by pacing around the room. However, the king's constant planning had backfired. Years of Mithridatism rendered his poison mixture ineffectual, condemning himself to a violent death. Before ordering his Celtic bodyguard to run him through with his sword, Mithridates gave one last speech which, while mostly embellished or fictionalized, nevertheless captures the irony of it all. Quote, I have profited much from your right arm against my enemies. I shall profit from it most of all if you will kill me, and save me the danger of being led in a Roman triumph, one who has been so many years the absolute monarch of so great a kingdom, but who is now unable to die by poison. Although I have kept watch and ward against all the poisons that a man takes with his food, I have not provided against that most deadly of all poisons, which is to be found in every king's house, the faithlessness of army, children, and friend. With Mithridates' death, Pontus became a client kingdom of Rome for the next 300 years, though his descendants still continued to rule. While Mithridates was memorialized in Roman histories as one of their greatest and most devious of foes, occupying a list that included Hannibal Barca and Pyrrhus of Epirus, he became renowned throughout antiquity and beyond for his penchant for poisoning and pharmacology. We will ultimately never know the extent to which we can trust the claims of historians regarding the king's legendary constitution, or his more devious predilection for murder by poison. However, for those living in antiquity and beyond, it was very real. His recipes and treatises were translated into Latin, relied upon by Roman emperors and medieval kings alike, who shared the same fear of a perilous mortality that had afflicted Mithridates so many years before. Thank you all for watching the video and for allowing me to slide in lieu of your regular Flashpoint history content. If you want to find out more about Mithridates, I highly recommend that you check out the transcript for this episode, which provides a bibliography and list of sources and citations to find out more. But why not also check out my show, where we will cover Mithridates and other fascinating topics throughout one of the most exciting times in history. The Hellenistic Age is available through my YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts. In the meantime, thank you all once again, and I hope to see you soon.